All right, catch us here, which means we can get started. <laughs> You're on time. All right, so this is our final core conversation of the conference. I uh, hope it's a good one. We're going to be talking about the Drupal 8 release cycle and how we can make it more future friendly. So first off, let's talk about what our release cycle is now, at least the story we like to tell ourselves. So it works like this. Some version of Drupal comes out, and it's wonderful, and we all party, and things are good, and we open up development on the next version of Drupal. And you know, we try to make everything better. And we can improve anything, and the sky's the limit. Uh, and we can break APIs we need to in order to improve things. And this is what core developers see, is that we can improve anything. And this is what everyone else sees. We can just change stuff. And that's scary. And we, we have this idea that we allow ourselves to break APIs in order to innovate. That we make Drupal better by changing things. And that's true to an extent. But we eventually hit this API freeze phase. Um, which is actually sometimes more of an API slush and, um, okay, maybe yogurt. I don't know. <laughs> so, kind of sort of frozen. It, it chills eventually. And we go, go into the space of just fixing bugs. Where we're fixing bugs all along and adding features, now we're just fixing bugs. And time passes while we do that, and eventually we get down to zero criticals, and we release, and everything is happy, and we start all over again. <laughs> And this is how core development works. Those of you who have actually been involved in core development, how realistic is this? The yogurt is spot on. <laughs> the yogurt is spot on. Here's more what it actually is like, speaking as someone who's now lived through three as a, a major contributor. Here's what happens. We release a major version of Drupal. And everyone falls asleep for a while because we're exhausted and burned out. And we and then the core team just kind of ignores that stable because there's a new stable to start working on. We've got the next version. Let's go work on that now. And we just keep on doing the stuff we were doing before that now we can do again because we can break APIs again. Wonderful. And so we start designing new stuff and add new features and you know, improve the UI, do all this wonderful stuff. And we don't necessarily know that it's right because the new old version has only been out for a day and a half and we're already designing new stuff. Did, does the old stuff actually work? Well, we can, our guesses are sometimes pretty good, but they're still guesses. We are not actually operating on data to determine if we actually need to change something. And we have no idea how long it's going to be until the next release, because Dries doesn't tell us. And so we're all in a panic trying to figure out, OK, can I do something big? Do I do something small? If I do something small, does it mean I won't be able to justify the big thing? If I do the big thing, will I not get it in in time, which means that nothing has gotten done? I can't plan when I have no idea how long it's going to be. So I'm just going to panic and then try and get stuff done as much as I can. And we try to fix everything we possibly can in as spastic a method as possible because that's all we can do, which means that we change everything and break it for everybody as usual. And then eventually, eventually, Dries announces a, a feature freeze date. And it's usually way closer than we want it to be, given wherever we are at that point. And so we panic again and keep on panicking, throw time into it, work on weekends and evenings, and stay up late at night. And we finally hit freeze, by which I mean slush, by which I mean, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> API freeze is such a loose term. <laughs> and at this point, a lot of people wander off because we're not adding cool stuff, we're just fixing bugs. Fixing bugs isn't sexy, so we're going to leave. Or, I've already been working for the past year and a half. I'm exhausted, so I'm going to go take a nap and let someone else fix the bugs. And this phase of Drupal 7 lasted way too long. And I see some people here in the front row who are nodding in pain. <clears throat> and really, only the, only the few stubborn gits remain in core at this point to finally clean things up and get it released. Because everyone else is just kind of burned out and tired. And finally, we stumble into a 1.0, a point zero release of the next version, barely awake, so, you know, carrying each other over our arms because that's all the energy we have left. And we get this release out, and then we try and do it all over again. This is actually how core development works for those of you who haven't been in it. This is how all projects in software used to work. Yeah, this is how all software projects used to work. So how did that change exactly? 
agile. Hmm. So why are we panicking? This is a quote from Chris Vanderwater, uh, Clips GC, who's the initiative lead for Scotch, <coughs> the blocks and layout. This is about six months ago that he said this. Yeah, I'm burned out. I'm losing sleep. But I'm too stubborn to care about my own feelings because I know I have to live with this for the next three years. Because we expect at this point our core releases are going to last a long time. Programming is like sex. Make one mistake and support it for the rest of your life. <laughs> and when you don't know if it's a mistake or not for three years, it's kind of worrisome. <laughs> Another problem. You know, it'd be nice to get companies involved in core development. And we talk about this at every conference. How do we get more companies involved in core development and supporting Drupal? You know, large companies like long release cycles. You know, large anything you know, likes a long release cycle. Large nonprofits, large for-profits, governments, anyone who has large investments, they like this idea of a long, stable release cycle. But it also means that why am I going to bother contributing when if I put an engineer on something to work on core, I'm not actually going to be able to use it for three years. And I'm just talking about core, to say nothing of contrib catching up. And so a lot of companies don't, because you know, it wouldn't be of any value to them. The, the turnaround time is too long. Sometimes these API breaks we do are necessary to evolve. That is completely true. If you don't ever break APIs, you turn it into Windows Millennium Edition. And I see some people nodding in pain on that one, too. There, there's actually code in Windows Millennium that special cased SimCity 2000, the game, and retained a bug from Windows 95 to support just that one game because they couldn't break that. We don't want to do that. Believe me, we don't want to do that. We, we, we go to the other extreme, however. If the only way you can innovate is breaking APIs, I've got news for you. You don't actually have an API. You have a pile of code. A pile of code does not qualify as an API. APIs let you evolve and innovate without breaking things by sneezing. Drupal 8 breaks a lot of things. It was a necessary shift. We are catching up with eight years of development in the PHP world with Drupal 8. We are fast forwarding through eight years of evolution in two years. That's a big break. It's necessary. That should not be the normal case. Drupal 8 should be an exceptional release, both as in exceptional really cool and exceptional as in not normal. I'm seeing a lot of people nodding with that one, especially people who have worked on core. So what do we actually need here? You, you need, want the picture? OK. <laughs> what we actually need to be doing is we need more stability. We need ability to rely on something, both for ourselves and for our clients, that is not going to change all the time without having less development. We don't need less, you know, fewer changes because you have fewer people working. That's not what we need at all. We need to be able to develop with better stability as we go forward. We need to be able to iterate rapidly. We need to be able to improve in smaller chunks, in bits and pieces. We need to have a shorter ROI. We need to be able to say, I'm going to put time into this task, into this improvement, and I'm going to be able to use it in four months, in six months, not in three years. Because if I can't use it for three years, why am I going to bother unless I'm a completely crazy fanatic who is going to do this just for fun because he's a sick and twisted human being. I, I admit it. We need to be able to improve without breaking things. This is something that Core has been very bad at. Contrib actually has been better at than Core in many ways. So how do we get there? How do we have a system that lets us do that? You need to have loosely coupled components. Loosely coupled components let you evolve individual pieces without breaking each other. We need to have a clear separation of concerns. We need to be able to have this piece of code deals with the database, this piece of code deals with display, this piece of code deals with HTTP, this piece of code deals with validation, and they deal with just those one, that one piece, just the, their piece, which means changes to the other pieces don't affect them. That's how you get stability. We need clear boundaries between our APIs. When you have a, you know, a big, gigantic blob of arrays, 
is not an API because you don't know what side of it you're on. You don't have that separation of concerns. You don't have that clear boundary behind which you can make changes. We need swappable components. If you can take a component, rip it out and replace it with something else that follows the same interface, that means you can improve that, that system. The thing you rip it out with and replace it with can be just the same thing, only iteratively better. And as long as you don't change that interface, nothing else breaks. Your code is still stable. Your API is still stable. That's a feature for backward compatibility, for forward compatibility, for supporting alternate systems, um, for testability. Th this is just good code in general. <coughs> Basically, we need clear interfa interfaces and real, honest-to-God APIs. That's how we get to the point of being able to improve without breaking things by improving. Guess what we've been doing for the last two years in Drupal 8? We've been refactoring the system heavily for exactly this reason. All of those things are, have been the guiding principles for Drupal 8's architecture. All of those things we need that are prerequisites for being able to evolve our system without massive API breaks are exactly why we've been breaking so many APIs in Drupal 8, to get to that point. Things like dependency injection get us this ability. Interface-driven development gets us this ability. Putting, you know, separating out code into the Drupal component library gets us this ability because this forces us to have loosely coupled systems that are not dependent on the application layer. Drupal 8 makes this possible for the first time in the history of Drupal. So let's do it. How exactly would that work? What, well, how would we be able to evolve our code now? For example, here's a, a small example. Uh, this is the class book manager. It's in the book module. Mark Sonnenbaum has argued that it's, it's a terribly named class and it should be called a book repository. Maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong. I'm not going to debate that. Let's assume for the moment he's right. How do we ma make that fix without breaking APIs? You simply extend the class and then anything that type hints on the old class, it's still going to work. Core uses the new one, it gets the new capabilities of the new object. Anything using the old one, it's not going to use the new capabilities anyway. That's fine. <coughs> it can still you know, use the old code, even call it uh, by the old name, that's fine, use the old tools. And Core can do the new cool stuff. And Contrib that comes out after we make that change or updates after we make that change can use it too. No APIs have been broken, we've added functionality. There's some cases where it's not quite that simple. You need to actually, you know, branch the code. All right. We have, you know, our old interface for something, and we have a new interface, and then, all right, do whatever the default logic was before, but if you're using the new stuff, vary based on that. Great. Modules can use the old code and just keep on tr trucking with that, or you can use the new code and get the new benefits out of it. Whatever makes sense for them, if they just wrote it once and are bored and leave it there for two years, it's fine, it doesn't break. Does this introduce a little bit of Croft? A little bit. That's okay. When we do get to the next point where we can change APIs again, this is really easy to clean up. It's really easy to say, all right, it's now called book manager, it's now called book repository, we're gonna fold all those interfaces, uh, the new methods up into the base class again. I'm just gonna merge it. Code that's already been updated to that within Drupal 8, it's not an API change for that. Only for code that hasn't been updated, but you had the opportunity anywhere along the way to keep up with the clear direction things are moving. Anything that's a service can be swapped out. That's why we have this dependency injection container in core, because not just can you easily swap out your database-based cache from memcache or easily swap out um, database-based router for something that uses MongoDB. <laughs> you can also swap out that database-based router for a better database-based router that uses a different uh, algorithm for finding routes. You could swap out five different classes that are all composed behind the router interface itself and completely re-architect that system as long as the parts that we say are the public part of the routing API doesn't change we can completely refactor the stuff behind there. We did a little bit of this in Drupal 7 during development in the database layer, where we changed internal data structures without changing APIs. I couldn't tell you 
which what direction we change it because it didn't matter. The API never changed. This is the next same idea, the next level up. We can just add functionality, just straight out add stuff. For example, we don't have a UI for the REST module in Drupal 8. We decided it'd be too complicated, let's just get the API working. You can edit the files directly. It's ugly but, and clunky, but it works. There's a REST UI module in, the prog in progress in Contrib. Once it's stabilized, throw it into core. I'm cool with that. There's no reason not to, it doesn't break any APIs, but people using core get a clear benefit out of it. Core gets better without having to break anything. Uh, right now our support for hyperlinks on REST resources is okay, it could get better. We can improve that without breaking anything because nothing's actually using those yet. We're just exposing new capabilities. Uh, right now, we primarily support JSON and XML as kind of a second class citizen. Beef that up, fully support at the XML variant of HAL. Uh, our link documentation for def defining the links we have um, is currently mediocre at best. Do we have any actually? Okay, we don't have any built-in <laughs> automated link documentation. Build in the systems to do that. That doesn't break anything, it just adds more functionality and improves the support for RESTful web services. This is just within the REST module. Here's four or five things we can do just in the REST module to make it better without breaking anything. Uh, who was here for Eaton's session yesterday on Snowman? They were talking about, you know, put in one uh, install profile with for core that's fully baked, but there's really these three general concepts. Fine, ship one with Drupal 8, Add some others later. Those don't break anything, but they add better experience for new users who can say, all right, I'm not an organization trying to express my mission. I'm just a personal person with my you know, profile or whatever. So I'm gonna turn on that instead. We can add that easily without breaking anything. Um, there's changes to the admin. There's, there's an issue, I couldn't actually find the issue for it. Um, the taxonomy admin page, uh, the pager on it when you have and uh, nested taxonomy terms and a very long list, the pager on it makes it really hard to use. And there's been an open issue for a long time to figure out what to do with that. That kind of, a, you know, of interface change, we can totally do in ways that don't break APIs. It just makes the UI better. We can totally make our UI better without breaking APIs, really. We can continue to refi revi it'll refine the style guide for seven. There's been a lot of just tweaks to, to the style guide, improvements, tighten things up, standardize better. We can just continue that work because that doesn't change an API. That just means that all of our fonts look better and the user experience is more pleasant. That totally is doable. Uh, we can improve our caching. There's a, an open issue right now to add caching to the state system. If that didn't happen by the time 8.0 shipped, it doesn't break anything to add it later. Cool, fine, do so. Uh, there's been talk this week about, are Fubi or Sam here? Of, of course they aren't. There's been talk this week of having you know, a new way to uh, register uh, controllers for the routing system using a dedicated class of some kind, maybe annotations. You know, I don't want to deal with that right now, but if we find later on that is a good, you know, a, a, a good improvement, we can add that as another option for ways to register routes and it doesn't break any of our current ones. Uh, there was talk at one point of bridging from hooks to events so that you, know, you could use events to listen to a hook call or use hooks to listen to an event or some kind of stepping stone to get people moved from hooks over to events. Probably not happening for 8.0. Adding that doesn't break anything. So we could totally add that as a guide for people, a way to let people step up and get used to new, these new tools. And this is just what I came up with in about five minutes of thinking about it. I'm sure if we, you know, we could spend an hour here coming up with another, you know, dozen things that we could do that don't actually break APIs, but still make Drupal core better, that are not simply throwing more modules into core. There's way more things we could do to improve Drupal than just throw modules into core. In order to do this, we need to understand what an API is. Until recently, I'm not sure who changed it on me before I got a screenshot of it. <laughs> you like you give me a you do know. <laughs> Until recently, if you asked Drupalcon and IRC what an API was, it responded with this. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> this was actually how we thought about things until recently. It is fundamentally wrong. <laughs> and this is why we can't have nice things. 
we need to get away from this idea of an API in order to be able to change things without breaking APIs. Because as long as this is how we define API, we can't do Jack. Now, I'm sure some of you are going to ask, you know, didn't we do that for 7? We did add features in 7. Kind of. We backported smaller things. There were no real big changes in 7. We added some hooks here and there, made some things. Yeah, post-release yeah, post to 7, after 7.0. But none of them were really large. Who actually had saw a big change in the 7X series? I didn't. I mean, really, did, did anyone notice? Maybe mod, okay, one person here. Module developers who needed one specific hook probably noticed. That's a very, very small use case. Because the attention for most developers was always on Drupal 8 because we have no idea how long it's going to be, so panic and get stuff done. So that's where all the attention was. 7 was abandoned as soon as it was released. Okay, not for support. We've got you know, plenty of bug fix support and so forth. But in terms of actual feature development, it was abandoned the day it was released. And that's been our de facto policy for several releases. And even then, Drupal 8, a year later, after 7 was released, wasn't that different. Okay, we moved everything under the slash core directory. If we hadn't done that, Drupal 8, as of you know, early 2012, was, what, 95% API compatible with Drupal 7? It wasn't that big? What's that? More than that? Yeah. It still took a long time for us to really get around to breaking things. <laughs> We could have done that straight in seven. We were too tired. Yeah, we were too tired to really break things. We, we needed to take. No strength. <laughs> yeah, we had no strength left to break things. Take a nap first. So here's what I'm suggesting. Here's the proposal. Once Drupal 8 is released, do not open development on Drupal 9 for at least a year. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't even need the rest of my bullet points then. Great. <laughs> We can then go ahead, add significant non-API breaking features to Drupal 8. That's I'm <laughs> this is going to be my easiest sales pitch ever. <laughs> Force ourselves to actually think about backward compatibility. We have trained ourselves to think that innovation only happens by breaking APIs. We need to unlearn that. Force ourselves to unlearn that. When we come up with things you want to do that are going to have to break backward compatibility, keep track of them. Don't just forget about it. Have a branch somewhere. Have an issue somewhere. You know, don't forget about these things. And once we decide, OK, we're finally ready to open Drupal 9 developments, which is at least a year away, focus just on those. Don't have a big free-for-all do anything. Just have a, here's the API changes we, need, we, need, we know we need to do. Here's the large refactoring we know we need to do. There's been talk uh, of you know, replacing form API with a symphony form system. Totally not happening in Drupal 8, any version. <laughs> Drupal 9, let's talk. There's talk of you know, removing hooks entirely and just using events. Totally not happening in Drupal 8. Drupal 9, let's talk. You know, if we need to you know, really break the, I don't know, the caching system in some way, you know, we want to add functionality that completely changes how cache tags work and is incompatible with the old way. Save that for Drupal 9, do some skunk works on it, but that doesn't actually get attention, doesn't get committed until we get to 9, which means at least a year away making sure we can do things on 8. And refining 8 and making 8 better. This would be hard. We are very used to the idea of I can improve things by breaking it. We're used to taking things apart and putting them back together again and having pieces left over because that's what we do. It will be hard to adjust. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It will be hard for the core team to get used to this model. But this is how we can have our cake and eat it too, or at least part of our cake. This is how we can move forward as a project. So let's assume for a moment, I'm going to be an optimist, that 8.0 comes out in January. <laughs> Told you I was a stand-up comedian. So in February, we release 801. Yes, sem semantic versioning. Because that's what semantic versioning means is exactly this model. This is the versioning system used by pretty much every project in the universe except Drupal and web browsers. And they don't break things between even their large numbers. March, 802. Fine. April, okay, 8.1. With whatever new features we've come up with in the meantime. 
What's that? Or the upgrade path. And the upgrade path. So at 8.1, that's where we get our, uh, our migrate path from Drupal 6. Um, in May, 8.11, keep on going with this pattern. Bug fixes or security patches. You know, if, if we find security holes, we fix them the same way we do now. Keep on going, just work our way through for at least a year in this pattern. Now here I have every three months for a feature release. Four months is good too. It's not a, a huge deal to me what the number is. Three or four months though means it's within the time period of most mid to large client projects. That means we could get clients funding core work that would actually be available in a stable core release by the time the project launches. Oh my God, that's never happened before. <laughs> Microphone, microphone. Are you assuming as soon as you come out with 801, that's not good either, I'm blocking the <laughs> uh, 801, that people are going to immediately upgrade from 802. My assumption would be that we might have some people on 81 and some people on 80, which mm -hmm. means we're now going to be maintaining uh, security patches and critical bug fixes to 8081 and 82 is what we're working on. That's two slides later. I'll be there in a moment. <laughs> so there are potential problems here. And I tried to come up with what were the likely pushbacks. So first of all, you know, how do we innovate when we can't change things? The same way that everyone else does, we learn how to advance without breaking things. You can do it. Many projects do, we can too. You know, do we know that all these new APIs we've built are actually up to this task? To be honest, I can't guarantee that they are. I can say they are going to be more up to the task than Drupal 7 was, and let's find out. We will probably find some of our APIs are really easy to extend without breaking things, and others, we screwed up and are not as extensible as we thought. And we can then know that with data rather than guesswork. And we know what we then need to change in Drupal 9. You know, this has pushed Drupal 9 even further away. All these changes we want to do for 9 pushes it further away. Does it? Or does it just mean we've got two years on Drupal 8 and then one year total for Drupal 9 and we've still got a three-year release cycle, but it's a much smoother path rather than this big herky-jerky break and freeze nonsense. Or if it means Drupal 9 is four years away instead of three years away and we've still got all these new features in Drupal 8, I don't think people are going to complain that much if we can still get our new toys. Drupal.org probably can't handle this at this point. It's infrastructure. <laughs> Drupal Association is responsible for that. I'm, I'm sorry, this is the easiest one to solve. DA, put some money into making the system, our packaging system support semantic versioning. That's your job. Do it. That's not an actual objection. Translations. In the past, we've had an idea that you know, we cannot touch strings because that would break all of our translations, and then people with an, a non-English site suddenly have English text showing up. That used to be true. Localize.drupal.org now offers translations straight over the web. We're downloading translations as part of the installer dynamically. I'm pretty sure we can figure out a way to release new translations for core at the same time. <laughs> all right, Dr Drupal 7, you can already do this, although it's quirky. So we make it less quirky, and we're good to go. We just say, all right, string freeze is a month before whatever the next stable feature release is going to be, so we can update our translations. Great. But I like our th the playground. I like the sandbox. You know, that, that's a fair criticism. But you know what? This is a multi-million dollar industry. We're not a sandbox project anymore. We're supporting the websites of Fortune 500 companies, world governments, banks, uh, major social movements. It's not our playground anymore. Contrib can be a playground. Core is not a free-for-all playground we can't afford to be. This is growing up. Security releases, as you mentioned, this is one concern. You know, what do we do with support for uh, 8.0, 8.1 after 8.2 and 8.3 come out? So, you know, do we provide security patches for older, sta older stable releases? You know, and do we have an idea of a long-term support release? Do we have to pick one of these and say, all right, we're going to keep supporting bug fixes on this one and security on this one, but not some of the others? Th there's an open issue where we've been discussing this for like three years and hasn't come to a conclusion yet. 
you know, do we expect people to upgrade? You know, when 8.2 comes out, do we expect all those people on 8.1.2 to upgrade immediately? Or do we support them? They're probably not going to uh, upgrade immediately. And the security team is really, really worried that they're already overworked, and we're now telling them they've got to support five versions of Drupal? We, you know, what do we do with that? This really is the only difficult problem, and frankly, I don't think it's as difficult as we make it out to be. Since there's so few changes, eh, breaking changes between releases, backporting a security release from 8.2 to 8.1 is a git cherry pick. It's not hard. You wanna, you know, if we decide we do need more people on the security team, which the security team insists we do, all right. Security team is not directing Drupal development. Hey, DA, get some security sponsors. Get companies that will just sponsor the security team you know, to pay for a few hours a week of a dozen people's time to keep track of this stuff. There are options here. You know, either one of these is a valid idea. There's probably more. You know, we can talk about this one, but this is a solvable problem. This is not going to block this if we decide to go forward. What we get out of this, and I should talk faster. <coughs> we get faster <laughs> We get faster improvements. We get the ability to iterate faster and improve Drupal faster than we do now. We get lower stress because we know when our next release is. We know that if I don't get this new feature in this improvement to the plugin system in by 8.2, 8.3 is three months away. I can deal. I can live. It's okay. It's easier for companies to get involved, you know, because they can put people on and know they're going to get a return on in three, four, six months rather than three, four, six years. And I'm not just talking about big companies. This isn't just IBM, Capgemini. You know, the White House, what's that? One company. Who, who are you with? Sense Publishing. With, you know, publishing companies, um, you know, NBC. It's not just them. It's also the small shops. If you can have a developer work, you know, five hours a week for three weeks as part of a client project to improve something for Core, and by the time the project launches, Core has that feature in a stable release, you've now had your client fund Core development during your normal business hours. How awesome is that? And it's a learning experience. You know, improving without breaking APIs is a different skill set. This makes us better developers by forcing ourselves to do this. By giving ourselves a constraint, we can learn to become more creative and more uh, capable developers. And frankly, it's good PR. Drupal does get knocked for the fact that we break APIs all the time. If we can say, you know what? You're right. We're fixing that. That's good. That makes c customers more interested. That makes other developers more interested. That raises our profile. That's good for the project. And when we get to developing Drupal 9, we actually know what's needed because we have data to say, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, rather than, I don't like this, I think this is going to not work, and so forth, and I have to start now because I don't know when I'm going to be able to fix it otherwise. What do we do to get ready for this? Decide what qualifies as an API. Is an API, you know, an API is not a function. Just because something is a function does not make it an API. That's state, statement one. So is it just interfaces? Is that the only thing we qualify as an API? Is the structure of a FAPI array an API? I'm going to go ahead and say no. A specific admin form's FAPI structure is not part of its API. Because if we say that, then we can never touch that form and we lose the entire point of being able to iterate. You know, don't change the structure of FAPI itself. Don't change what the elements are. But a specific form, if we have to change it to, in order to fix a usability problem, do it. Clearly communicate what qualifies as an API. Uh, in a f I don't think we're doing this anywhere, but some projects use an API tag in their documentation, which means this is stable. We guarantee this thing will not break on you. Let's start marking those things that we can say that about, which may not be the entire system. In 8.1, we can say, all right, we're sure about this part now, and expand the list of things that are so marked. Symphony does this. Yeah, Node.js has a mechanism for doing this. Symphony does this. This is not something that would be a Drupalism. This is something other projects do. We're already marking things as deprecated. If we know that Book Manager is going away and being replaced by Book Repository, mark Book Manager as deprecated. That signals to developers, hey, by the way, don't use this. Use this other thing instead. You'll be happier later. We are already doing this in core. We can keep doing it. Um, just make sure that all the stuff we've been doing for clean interfaces and swappability actually works. 
In many cases, that's try it and see what breaks. And if it breaks, let's fix it. Same thing we've been talking about with contrib modules at this point. And then, make, of course, make sure that Drupal.org can handle uh, this kind of packaging. Solvable problems. Dries likes to talk about Drupal growing up and you know, the, the stages of life and you know, we're in a young adult getting our first job. This is what adulthood looks like as a project. And that's okay. Discuss. Microphone's up here. And these are uh, some other issues. Uh, this is the Semver issue. I'm going to put these slides online. This is the semantic versioning issue where we've been arguing this forever. <coughs> um, WebChick recently suggested actually using private variables and private methods, which currently we don't touch. I don't like privates. If we can actually. <laughs> I'm talking about the military. <laughs> I'm not a fan of private variables, but you know, if doing that lets us more clearly define the API, I'm open to discussing it. If we can actually you know, use that as a tool to help communicate this better. Thoughts? So when you open up development for, for nine, mm -hmm. what happens, does, are we still doing these minor releases with eight all through that time? And do we have enough manpower, person power, sorry, to uh, make that happen? Maybe. Or maybe we say, you know, by the time we get to 8.5, all right, stop on that, just do security releases on that while we work on 9. I'm flexible. I think there's a good argument both ways. We could pr it probably depends on what we have lined up for D9. We can decide it then. Hi. Um, sorry, I was late to the beginning, so I hope I didn't miss this. But um, I'm kind of wondering when you're saying like 8.3 mm -hmm. with the feature release um, text next to it, are you talking about having 8 evolve or preparing to evolve 9 for a release? This is eight evolving and having new features, having new functionality, improving the APIs, changing them in ways that are backward compatible and so forth within the eight cycle before, there, before a Drupal 9 even exists as Okay, a so you're basically saying to have a release process for eight that is mm -hmm. fixed, but a feature process for eight that is uh, flexible. Is that, am I understanding that right? I'm not sure I understand. Like so feature development would happen on a schedule in eight and when we get to nine, we can probably follow the same process more or less there, so which means Drupal 9 itself, 9.0, it becomes a less earth-shattering release than Drupal 8 was. And a lot of the changes in it, people have already been queued up on, so they already know what's coming and can prepare for them. Cool, I like that. Also, um, I would love to see this applied to some of the stuff that we've already done. Like, can you give us, maybe later after the con, <laughs> um, an example of one small uh, project that was within the scope of eight that we've been working on that maybe made us run late that could have been taken to this type of example and shoved out into a feature that's a planned release during the eight process. Give, given that yeah. mm -hmm. that was flexible enough to. Exactly. Um, so okay, here, here's an example. Here's an example that's near and dear to me. I'd love to, for our database layer to not be dependent on Drupal. Right now, it's in the, the, core, the Drupal core namespace, and there's a few calls in it to uh, Drupal functionality, like you know, an alter hook. If within Drupal 8, we replace that alter hook with a wrapper that's part of the database layer that can be anything else to extend and alter that, um, that, uh, that query, push the whole thing over to Drupal component, have subclasses in place that are just you know, bare extensions of the pre previous classes. They're empty classes. And one implementation of that little bridge that does the hook. We have now refactored the code to be Drupal independent and can use the database layer outside of Drupal and nothing in Drupal notices. That's something we could do. Uh, the plugin system has been designed in two parts the same way for exactly that reason. Um, I think I heard someone mention profile module. There's probably stuff we could do to make profile module better. I'm not sure exactly what they said. I just bumped an issue yesterday. Uh, okay. Um, adding, uh, here's one I forgot. Uh, adding fields to files, file entity in core. In the media uh, session yesterday, it sounded like pretty much everyone agreed files need fields. And that never quite happened in core. We can still do that because it doesn't break anything. And, and so forth. Those are the kind of things I think we can pull off. 
In your uh, examples about uh, the versioning, you, may you give examples with uh, a fixed timing per month. Do you think that this means we should go to toward uh, scheduled uh, releases, mm -hmm. really? I mean, in every quarter, quarter there will be a new uh, feature version, or is it, will it, would this still be driven by what really happens? I think we should go ahead and just schedule them. We already have monthly releases for core. Um, what if nothing got in? If nothing got in, all right, maybe we skip it that month. Right, so it's like a release window, just like we already did. Yeah, but I'd be surprised if there's n absolutely no features that come out in a, a new release. I mean, we like to write code, let's be honest. <laughs> um, do you think that this process should have been used for the entire Drupal 8 lifecycle, because it's a complete mind shift, well, not a complete mind mm -hmm. shift, but a significant mind shift. Do you think it's too late to change to this mind shift now, <laughs> and you should have had it at the start? <laughs> in, in other words, that this, this uh, release, or this method, let's call it, mm -hmm. would be much more appropriate to a D9 lifecycle rather than D8. How would you feel about that? For the development of, for the shift from seven to eight, this would not have worked, because eight needed to change so many things to catch up with eight years of development. Within the eight cycle, once we actually launch 8.0, that's exactly w a good time to start doing this, now that we actually can. Okay. So one thing I would say, we could have not opened Drupal 8 mm -hmm. until nine months after or a year after, and it would have made absolutely no difference to where we are now, except it would have been easier to fix Drupal 7. But, so that part we could have done. And, sorry. <laughs> The one because I I have been thinking about a lot. Got to a very similar place as Larry's presentation, and the thing that drove me to it was I didn't like the Drupal eight open when it did, and I would have liked for it to open nine months later because in practice hardly anything got in, but it made it twice as much work to fix the Drupal seven stuff. Um, we could have done that. That's something we could have done that we didn't do. Um, I actually put on Twitter. I actually said that a bit like a month before Drupal eight opened up, so I was not happy. Um, <laughs> so so that one thing that we would do now, like, we could have done that. All the rest of it, no. Like, it, no, mm -hmm. it, it was not possible. Um, well, it really did make it twice as hard to, it, it, as git pick, uh, a cherry uh, picking. Yeah, we, we didn't use git cherry picking, and, and you didn't have commit access to Drupal 8. There were, like, a, a, the process issues, but it did, did make it harder. In practice, it was harder. It should not have been harder, but it was. Um, you asked about what is an API. Um, anything that's documented on Drupal code or, or in the code, um, a good content module it is, can use that. So if you break that, you're potentially breaking um, content modules um, in a features upgrade. Um, so I would say you define as much as possible as unbreakable, and then if you find that's causing problems in development, then we look at certain edge cases. But if you start strict, it's a lot easier to loosen up that policy than the other way around, and you could get... Um, you know, when 8.1 comes along and you've told everyone it's going to be an easy upgrade um, and if suddenly they find that half the control modules are broken, that could lead to a lot of bad PR. So are you suggesting we start off with a big list of things that are qualify as an API or a small list? A big list. And then if you're finding that you really need to break something, then you think carefully and possibly say, yes, this, this particular case we can break. But if you say that something is an API... Can we just give Catch a mic? <laughs> 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 no, no, seriously. The Drupal 8 release maintainer gets his own mic. Sorry. <laughs> if, if, if you say something's an API in 8.0.0, and in 8.3.0 you say, oh, actually, no, 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 it's not, it's not an API. <laughs> like, like, yeah, like. Psych! <laughs> no, that, that's fine. If you've got documentation that says this is an API, content modules can use it. So if we can define that up front, that's great, but I got the impression that was going to be a difficult task to do. So um, wouldn't the other, wouldn't the thing you would say, like, if it's if it's marked API, we only mark things API that we don't think are going to change. If you use anything else, then it's going to, we might break. So, and if we break it, then sorry, uh, maybe we even roll it back if it's if it's not been released yet or something. But if it's not marked as an API, it shouldn't be available for for a content module to use. And no, no, that no, is no, I th no. that is the place where I, I think, think we've been doing it wrong. I think that's a stability thing. Yeah. Like you mark this is stable. And this is like, right. or and if it's not marked, it, we don't guarantee it's stable. 
and then we add things that are stable like it, but there's going to be a lot of work to define what is and isn't stable i'm going to sit down and so stop talking <laughs> so, so what's i'll give you an example what symphony did with this uh, they they did follow this only some methods and some classes are tagged api and those do not break except for security reasons and if they can break can fix a security issue without doing so they do anything that's a public method that's not tagged api they try not to, but it's not a promise. But each release, 2.0, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, the number of things tagged API has increased. So like the forms system in Symfony did have API breaks from 2.0 to 2.1. Um, there were changes in the routing system from 2.1 to 2.2. Some of them security related, some not. Eventually, they got marked tagged API, and now those do not break. I think that's a better model. So we can have things that are part of the public API, for the recording I'm doing air quotes here, <laughs> um, that are not tagged with API, which means we're going to try not to break this, but we're not going to promise it. Stuff with an API tag, we're going to promise not to break unless we have to yeah. for security. I think that's a good way to do it. And then we can just grow that list of things that are tagged API as we stabilize, yeah. as we settle in. I think that works well for the maintainer of the content module. I think you need to be careful about someone, that their site builder role, that they need to know whether their content module is going to support the newer mm -hmm. feature release of Drupal. Yeah, and it, we do need to communicate. When we do break those others, we need to communicate it well. <laughs> and we can build tools for that. <laughs> Wait, what do you think we are, software developers? Larry, uh, thanks for this presentation. I think the topic has been looming above the project a bit, and mm -hmm. I think you're providing a clear path forward towards figuring this out and have this rite of passage into <laughs> adulthood. So uh, thanks, uh, it will enable uh, the, the right discussions. Um, what I'm thinking about is what will we put in place to not have time box panic? To not have time box panic? Four months of undirected, scattered efforts mm -hmm. that will still have Pull 10, the 10, yeah, for the, for the point one release, have, uh, I mean, we could, uh, I mean, initiatives mm -hmm. for Drupal 8 uh, has been mm -hmm. those clusters that might become sequences uh, for point releases. How do we uh, make use of the effectiveness we can gain from having time boxed mm -hmm. releases uh, by not scattering, but maybe focusing? So to some extent, as long as we agree that we're not gonna break an API in the process, we don't have to make it tightly controlled. We can still have, you know, crowdsourced, hey, this is a cool feature, and hey, it doesn't break API, so hey, let's do it. Um, we may want to have, uh, like for example, we may not want to have a micro initiative for hook event. Maybe that's just one patch. Maybe it's, you know, gonna be 12 patches, so we have, you know, a, a very small initiative for it. I'm not sure yet. It'll probably vary by the, the task. Um, but, you know, one of the advantages is if we don't get hook, if, hook event in by 8.1, 8.2 is not that far away. So you know, to some extent, I don't think we need to drastically change that process. Just let it happen organically once we have that additional control in place of don't break an API. And see what happens and adjust as needed. Cool. There, there's definite benefit, but there's definite risk. And I think we're going to have to have a mindset change to site maintainers. You know, a, a new point release comes out, and I almost upgrade it without testing. I mean, mm -hmm. I trust it, you know. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I mean, it goes through a lot mm -hmm. smaller rigorous testing process than everything else, because usually the security upgrades are pretty darn good. Um, you know, this is going to force, you know, contrib module maintainers are, is my contrib module now on 8.0 or 8.1 or 8.2, and a security update comes out mm -hmm. for 8.2 that forces me to upgrade, you know, my contrib to eight two, but now I have to upgrade. It does mm -hmm. complicate things, and it's going to force a change shift in in in, comp, in exponential uh, mm -hmm. version control uh, difficulties for everybody. I I think there's a lot of benefit to it, but we're going to have to we're going to break some mm -hmm. major site doing this. You know, you know, uh, NBC is going to upgrade accidentally. I I pulled them out of the air. I don't even know. Them. <laughs> you know, some no offense some to NBC. Some major company is going to accidentally upgrade and it's going to break their site and, and we might get a bad eye on it. Mm -hmm. So there's going to have to be a, a training here in, in doing it. Sure. True, but this makes core no less stable than the tier one contribs, 
which have been doing this for a long time. They've had feature development that doesn't break APIs and people upgrade and occasionally it goes wrong. You know, it's no worse than views. It's probably better. Okay, probably better than views. Yet there's been the expectation that we, we know that mm -hmm. happens, so we do more testing for those contrib modules when we upgrade them. Yeah, so we'll, and, and we definitely need to communicate this change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the issue of uh, API tagging, which you uh, mentioned repeatedly, uh, seems to be implicitly about PHP. Uh, how about uh, possible REST APIs we could uh, have or evolve during the li uh, .x li lifecycle, or maybe even JavaScript and possibly markup, uh, mm -hmm. so, so that uh, streamers have things which are stable during evolution? That's a good question. I don't know. For REST, I think we can definitely add stuff very easily. There's still plenty to add. Um, but yeah, like there's still an open issue to move the path that we use for entities to the correct entity path. That would be an API change that we can't do after 8.0, but it's already been approved to happen before that. Um, adding more links to it, we can do. JavaScript, we probably want to do something similar in terms of marking what is and isn't stable there. Um, and just to treat it the same way, I'm not a JavaScript expert, so I can't say what the conventions are there. Markup. That's a very good question. I don't have an answer. I, I don't know if markup should count as an API change or not. That's a Morton question. <laughs> yes, it Someone in the back of the room is saying, yes, it should. You basically kind of shift. <coughs> so in the same way that you can't pull the rug from underneath the feet of a PHP developer, no more can you pull the rug from underneath a front end mm -hmm. developer. So in other words, you have to, the same problem you have in defining an API for PHP, you have to define an API for markup, CSS, mm -hmm. and JavaScript. Define what is not going to break and what might break. It's no different. Harder job, mm -hmm. but same job. So I'll, I'll ask you that question then. I, as I said earlier, we can probably say the structure of a particular form in FAPI is not part of the API. If we have to change it in order to improve the UI there, we will. Are there parts of markup we could say that about or not? I, I don't know. I, I don't know either. I, okay. That would take a lot of thought. Yeah, that, that's a good question for us to, to keep to pondering here. The, the point is you just need, in the same way that you need to know what's going to break mm -hmm. and, what, and what will not break. That's the key part. Yeah. So first of all, I kind of want to say uh, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so so I've, I've been involved in Drupal for like kind of three years where, uh, you know, we're, we're a small enterprise company. We've got like 30 websites. We've built our own distro on Drupal 7. So we've got a little bit of experience, I'll be on a smaller scale of this problem. So we have 30 mm -hmm. websites sharing a distro. And we learned after about six months, it's a lot easier to break stuff little bits regularly than it is to break mm -hmm. stuff every six months. And it feels like that's gonna be true of Drupal 8, 9. Uh, and plus, like, as I mentioned in the other session, you'll get less developer fear as well, because if you're not changing a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. it's easier to get your head around lots of small changes, whether it's for a year or whatever. Um, so, but I think to answer the question about, you know, why are things breaking, if things break, but they're regular and but small, it's a lot easier for people to keep up. Um, and obviously, everyone's going to have BDD tests, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we break something and we have to break something for some reason, it should take contrib modules no more than an hour or two to account for it. If we can get to that point, then any accidental API breaks or security-based breaks are probably something we can swallow. Still don't want them, but if we can keep it to that level of scale, we'll be okay. And, and we do do that anyway. We do mm -hmm. break for security. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that that's catch saying yes we do still occasionally break APIs in core for security reasons. We try not to, but it does sometimes happen. And yeah, same thing still applies. Yeah, just wanting to add uh, about the preceding question about uh, so the standardization of markup. We still have uh, some, some something going on like componentization uh, based on the SysMax uh, mm -hmm. guidelines. That there's already a start for this, uh, so it's not completely out of uh, the blue. Mm -hmm. um, do you see so Contrib right now releases are, are different. There, there's a point one branch and a point two branch and stuff. And of course, you're not going to have the same rush of people wanting to get features in crazy in, in all these uh, contrib modules. Do you see uh, the contrib modules using the same kind of version naming scheme or a different approach? Why not? You know, we, pr we probably still need to mark them somehow for what contrib version they're compatible with. 
on the expectation that D9 will have non-trivial API breaks, and that's okay. But yeah, I see no, if Core is going to use you know, three-point semantic versioning, I see no reason we can't expose that to modules as well. I was wondering your thoughts on the initiatives, which have been very important in mm -hmm. Drupal 8, obviously. Do you have any opinions? How do you think that going forward in Drupal 9? Are you thinking maybe it should be, do you feel like it's been a, a success in Drupal 8 to divide work like this? And we continue that in Drupal 9, you think? I think initiatives were absolutely necessary for the scale of what we needed to do in Drupal 8. Um, we could have organized them better. A lot of the initiative leads have been talking about how we could have organized them better, most of which comes down to more people, clear resourcing, better planning, and so forth. For Drupal 9, we may or may not find that we need something at that scale. I don't know yet. Something the scale of replace form API with Symfony's forms, we'd probably need an initiative on that with a core team of four or five people and schedules and all that kind of stuff like we had for these initiatives. For, hey, we've got this list of five API changes we want to make to the plugin system to make it better, give Chris Vanderwater two weeks uh, to go do it and say it's okay and we're done. We don't need an initiative for that. What is going to need an initiative for Drupal 9, we'll find out then. My hope is that fewer things need it, that we can do smaller bite-sized changes now that we have this framework that will support it. Now that we've done the work to get there, we can get the benefit from it. Uh, during the life cycle of Drupal 7, um, when Drupal 8 was already started, uh, whenever someone asked a feature for Drupal 7, then someone said, yeah, you have to develop for Drupal 8 first. And I said, okay, I cannot install Drupal 8 on my machine, it doesn't work, I give up. Mm -hmm. So um, when we have Drupal 9 started, will we also uh, cherry pick things up, like develop on Drupal 8 first and then cherry pick it up to Drupal 9? I don't know, that's a good question. I, I personally would not. <coughs> Microphone. <laughs> um, so if we, if we do this and we have, say, However, however often it releases out, say three, four, six months at a time. So you get to 18 months and you have between four and five releases on Drupal 8. And then you open up Drupal 9. But what you say is the technical debt that we accrued over the past 18 months of backwards compatibility layers, they get ripped. And then <coughs> things that we could not commit to Drupal 8, like a complete form API rewrite, that is probably already being worked on anyway against Drupal, uh, like against the current state of Drupal 8, but when you open it, then you get start trying to get quite quickly <laughs> to change it around. You should have a much shorter Drupal 9 release process, um, and you're not gonna be making like all of the other changes that you were actually making ju to Drupal 8. Drupal 8 might get, like, I think the, I've lost what I was gonna say now. <laughs> the, it's not, it's Drupal 9 isn't gonna be like Drupal 7 or Drupal 8 was, it's gonna be like Drupal 8 was from like whenever it releases, it's yes, exactly. It's easy to backboard. Yeah. yeah um, but so, but still, someone who wants to develop for for Drupal eight actually has to install Drupal nine and get it running and so on. So you kind of just your local hacks. You kind of just push a, a post your local hacks or something. Yeah, I mean, I. If we can get to the point where Drupal nine only takes us nine months because all we're doing are the saved up API changes, it doesn't matter if we backport stuff because it's only nine months away. Uh, one idea I have is maybe that uh, for some phase in Drupal 9, like the beginning phase, it's just a number of feature branches or of, um, <laughs> experimental branches, and they get rebased from time to time, maybe. And then um, Git makes this way easier. And some so point we switch and say now Drupal 9 is the official thing, but before that we can still would, rebase and develop on Drupal 9. I would say at, at, the, at the moment, full reporting is impossible. Even for security patches, it's really hard if we need to see how it goes. And we also need to see how we're gonna deal with like inter Drupal 8 branch critical and security fixes. And we, after the experience of working on that, this, uh, this, uh, this is easy to answer. But I don't think it's easy to answer now. I wouldn't want to say, yeah, we're gonna start forward reporting and I wouldn't want to completely rule it out either. Okay, so one in, uh, unrelated thing I want to say is I love it because uh, it will also um, allow uh, uh, development driven by real needs and real world needs and feedback and so on. Okay. <coughs> last comment then? Um, so, oh, I'm the last one? Shoot. Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, I've, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in what does happen to the backport policy um, with this. And I think 
I, the thing that I found the most compelling was this sort of like, at least maybe even just for this cycle, the scenario where we, we do the three or four, or maybe six month releases, probably three or four month releases, feature releases, um, until we open 9X, and maybe for the first six months after we open 9X, but then stop doing that and focus mm -hmm. development on Drupal 9, that would, make, that would make the backport policy still manageable. Um, I think that's just off mm -hmm. the top of my head. And then the other thing that I'm really interested in is, is the question about initiatives, because when we, for, for, for Dries and for Angie, the, an, an initiative is a, is a feature package thing. Like it's, it's not just do a bunch of work in core, which is although certain initiative leads have used their shiny features as an excuse to do a bunch of API work. Who are you talking about? I can't imagine. <laughs> but so the, the idea is like we could, if we are making, if core initiatives are building things that require a lot of work but don't require breaking APIs, like, we, th mm -hmm. like I think that's half the point, right? But I'm, I, I'm still, tr I've been trying all week to wrap my mind around what happens, what we do about the major API rearchitecture that we need to do and how we, how we do resources for that. So we, it may that's make sense to have, for example, a you know, really make REST awesome initiative that has two or three people that are focused on non-API breaking changes that really make our REST API way more robust. That may make sense to do within the Drupal 8 cycle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, something like you know, changing our form API for Drupal 9 would definitely be initiative scale. Right, um, the, the things that are initiative scale, but not the like, oh, I need a configuration system. Now I'm right. going to put lots, hundreds of thousands of dollars into this. Not that Greg got that much mm -hmm. himself, but just <laughs> Yeah, so that's, well, I think that's the kind of thing we'll figure out as we go and say, all right, this particular thing is big enough. We need to just, uh, you know, put some larger structure around it. So uh, on that, are we saying that Drupal 9 will not have any features that are in Drupal 8.6? I'm not going to say no features, right. but, but, but necessary API changes will be the focus rather than features. Right, because then you, cause then you can add features to Drupal 9.1. Yeah. So, oh, that's, that's a good point. I, I mean, I, I feel like something, there are some features that are going to require significant contrib obliterating changes. I feel like, mm -hmm. I feel like, a, like, I'm not positive about this, and Chris might think I'm horribly wrong, but I feel like something the scale of like what blocks and layouts really wanted to do as their shiny would break way too many page, page structures to ever backport that feature to, to core only. Like, I mean, Contrib can do awesome mm -hmm. things. Very but, likely. So I feel like that, that as a feature initiative would have to be a Drupal 9 initiative mm -hmm. feature, feature wise. Um, so. so. <laughs> I think this sounds really good. And then I wonder, like, is it going to happen? Who's going to decide it? What does Dries think? <laughs> so I, I'll answer it this way. Is there anyone here in the room who is against this? All right. L then let's let's all go crowd around Dries and make sure he does it. <laughs> I've been doing it for three years. He thought, he thought I was mad, but what's that? I've been doing it for three years. He thought I was mad, but that might have changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think just from you know casual conversation, I think Dries would be open to this, um, and there's enough people that Dries trusts who certainly sound like they're open to it, that, yeah, I think we can make this happen. So let's make it happen. <laughs> so, so obligatory messages. Please review the session. You should all know where to go for that by now. I'm going to see all of you at the sprint tomorrow, right? Yes. Good. Yes. And I think we've got a coffee break and then closing ceremony, so let's all go there and see where DrupalCon is next year. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, thanks for that. It's brilliant. It's, I'm not the first one to suggest it. I'm just, I'm just a loud mouth. Look, as I said, I've, I've been only involved in Drupal three years, right? Mm -hmm. So I've been talking to people about this kind of stuff, like maintaining BC. Uh, you get these looks like you're. Well, because you, it's for, for people who work, yeah. it would have been completely insane for us to do it. Mm -hmm. Although there yeah, are five, six, and 